in that knowledge. But since the 1960s, of course, the social situation has changed. Actually, we've become even more degraded, more materialistic, and farther away from Krishna. So we have to change the uh, process, not the process of the esoteric teaching itself, but the presentation of that process uh, to match the understanding of the people today. So the exoteric uh, circle of the teaching is always changing. It changes to adapt to the social conditions of the time and place. It has to, simply practical. Uh, you look at every company. Uh, we were looking at uh, Coca-Cola ads the other day and uh, on the YouTube. And the Coca-Cola ads are different in every country. Huh? Like in the U.S., they had these, these rascals sitting down talking about suing Coca-Cola because they changed it. <laughs> Coke Zero, or whatever it is. It had, yeah, it has zero value now. Before, value. before it had a little, a little value, huh? Now it has zero. It always has zero. Well, yeah, but then people thought that it was nice. Anyway, <laughs> Coca-Cola, of course, is, is full of nonsense things like caffeine and so on. So, um, they're making one presentation in the US, a completely different presentation in Japan. In Japan, they have, uh, instead of a, a, a couple of nerds in a conference room talking about suing somebody, uh, they have uh, an auditorium full of men in suits. And then there's these guys on the stage in bikini suits. Uh, and everybody is making some strange chant in Japanese. <laughs> That's the end of the ad. I couldn't figure out. <laughs> and then the Chinese one. Oh, the, the Chinese, yeah, the Chinese ad, they shoot everybody at oh. the end. <laughs> This, this, woman with a, this woman with a machine gun just shoots her. It's crazy, huh? And um, what was the one, the, one in, uh, the one for Mexico and like that? It was like a number out of West Side Story with these kids in, in Queens, New York. It New York yeah. yeah, it was New York in Queens with the elevated subway. Yeah. And these kids are doing this dance and they were supposed to be gangs and they were... Whole different presentation. Same product, same name. Different people, zero value. But different, yeah, zero value. <laughs> but the point is the presentation was different for each culture. And they had done very careful psychological analysis to present exactly right uh, for the subconscious drives in that culture. Very, very exact analysis. Uh, the one from Italy, remember? Yeah. The guy goes crazy on the bus and then he like jumps on top and he's shouting and all these people are following and then the bus stops and he goes flying into the water and then... <laughs> Italians. <laughs> so anyway, I guess uh, the neighbors are having a parade. Maybe they're going to line up all the dogs. <laughs> Every neighbor has a dog. What's the yeah. drums are they're practicing? practicing? Yeah, I guess we got them going, so now they're playing oh, drums. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's great. If, he, if the neighbor can practice the drums, then we can have kirtans. Huh? Yeah. If everybody has dogs and they're all barking, then we can have kirtans. Yeah, yeah. nobody can complain. Huh? So it's good. So the structure of the esoteric teaching, at least on the outside, has to match or fit with or met, merge with uh, the social and uh, cultural situation in which we are preaching. So it has to adapt. And if it doesn't adapt, if it doesn't change, it becomes irrelevant. Uh, our God brothers haven't changed their presentation of the esoteric teaching 
in 30 or 40 years. And because of this, they have become irrelevant. Maya is always coming up with defenses against spiritual knowledge. Uh, so if you present spiritual knowledge in one way, then Maya will come up with a defense for that and stop it. So you have to be continually evolving in your presentation. You can't remain static. You can't remain still. Or Maya will evolve a perfect defense to stop your preaching. And we have to continually adapt, continually change our presentation. Not what we're saying, but how we say it. Right now we're in the middle of a, a whole analysis of the different generations and how their moods and attitudes are best uh, reached with our preaching presentations. And so we're trying to understand how to reach the, the youth in the early to mid-twenties, uh, single, uncommitted young men, basically, because they form the, and they always will form, the core of our Sangha. Uh, why is that? Because these are the leaders of the future. And so we need to catch them before they become all entangled with family and career and uh, so many possessions and all this stuff and say, whoa, wait a minute. Are you sure you want to go down that road? Huh? Do you really want to become like a servant of Maya? You really want to become entangled with women and children and stuff and business and all this? Huh? It's poison. It's heavy chains that weigh you down in this material world. Huh? No. While you're young, while you can change, while you can still learn, you have to change now. Don't become entangled. Avoid all those problems. Don't suffer. Don't become bitter. Huh? Don't lose your youthful idealism and self-confidence by uh, making a commitment to a, a bad deal. Huh? Avoid all that pain and suffering and become involved in the esoteric teaching while you're still young. Learn the ways of the teaching and make that your life. And you'll have a far more uh, wonderful and pleasant experience than if you get involved with all this materialistic stuff. So this is our, our main recruitment effort. Uh, because these young men are possibly can become teachers of the esoteric teaching. You see, we're not trying to make followers. We're trying to make teachers. If we have some followers on the exoteric side of the teaching, that's all right. But we're really not so interested in that. We're really interested is bringing people into the mesoteric circle of the teaching. Uh, now, what is the mesoteric circle? It's the circle that's in between the outside and the inside <laughs> of this esoteric teaching. This is the area where one uh, engages in transforming himself from a materialistic consciousness to spiritual consciousness. And so this is how we actually advance in spiritual life. Maybe next time we have the satsang in the back room where it's quiet. <laughs> huh? The dogs are having a party. <laughs> They're the dancing dogs. <laughs> the dancing dogs. What's right. that? Oh boy. They're dying Anyway, the mesoteric circle is in between. And this is where someone who has been associating with the exoteric circle, now they make a commitment. They make a decision. And they say, no, I'm not going to associate with Maya. I'm going to advance in the esoteric teaching with the goal of becoming a teacher myself. So the gate into the mesoteric circle is called the gate of initiation because it is at this point that the disciple takes initiation from the spiritual master. And he makes a promise. He makes a commitment. This is not just hanging out anymore. Huh? It's not just, just uh, association. It's, it's still association, but there's a commitment involved now. And the commitment is 
I will not perform any more sinful activities. I will follow the four regulative principles of spiritual life. No meat eating, no intoxication, no sex life, no gambling. Huh? I say no sex life instead of no illicit sex life because practically speaking, um, people in the West are incapable of sacred sex. Sacred sex means that one follows the Garbhadhan samskaras and creates Krishna conscious children according to Vedic principles. But almost nobody is capable of that. Uh, that's very difficult. Uh, you have to be very controlled. The, and most importantly, the wife also has to be Krishna conscious and pure. And this is very difficult to find a couple who can go into a spiritual life and both maintain the same standard. This is very rare, very 